I want to start by thanking uh, uh, Asia Society and Credit Suisse for the opportunity and the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let, me, uh, let me start by saying that in my uh, book that just came out two or three months ago, uh, I explained a little bit why I became so interested in the Belt and Road. And one of the reasons is that the Belt and Road is really about everything. It's about every geography and about every subject matter. I compare it in the preface to my book to one of those 19th century European novels, Flaubert or Dostoevsky, where the whole of human life is supposed to be included. So the Belt and Road can be about shipping, can be about cinema, can be about trade, politics, security. In 2015, one Chinese entrepreneur created a matchmaking service to introduce Ukrainian women to Chinese men as part of the Belt and Road gives you a, a, a good insight into how the concept is used in China, pretty much for everything. But I think that's a strength because it helps us find connections between areas that in the West are sometimes broken apart and disconnected. It is a comprehensive view of society and the world today. My interest in the Belt and Road after I left the Portuguese government, uh, when you lose an election and the socialists get into power, the best solution is to leave the country immediately. That's what I did in 2015. Um, and I went on a big uh, uh, journey throughout the areas separating Europe from Asia, China, Russia, uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, and uh, the Belt and Road immediately became obvious to me as a significant development in those parts of the world. I'll show you some pictures which are by now uh, three years old and I, I hope in the next two months to go back and see uh, what has changed. Uh, I'll show you three or four pictures to give you a sense of what the Belt and Road is. This is on the border between uh, Kazakhstan and uh, China uh, here. First picture, the dry port in Horgos. So this is a port as far away from the ocean as you can possibly imagine. But where trains are supposed to arrive from China and be recombined in different trains according to the destination, it takes just over an hour to uh, transport all the cargo from one train to another train. And then they leave for Europe, for Russia, for the Middle East. Uh, in the future, it may be responsible this port for 4% of the Europe-Asia trade, uh, which is really, really significant. You might think, looking at this first picture, that the Belt and Road is about infrastructure. And it's a good place to start, infrastructure, but certainly not the place to end. And you can, you can see that in Horgas, uh, where the port is settled. Next picture. This is the international cooperation area in Horgas. Um, it is essentially an amusement park for business. You go inside, you trade, you buy products without paying taxes, and you bring them out. The interesting thing is that it is built over the border, so that inside the park, you have an area that is Kazakhstan and an area that is China. This is the border inside the park between Kazakhstan and China, these towers here. But you can cross without any control, because the control exists on the external borders of the cooperation area, which is significant and large. And so you can cross between Kazakhstan and China without having any kind of control when you're inside the border. It's as if a mini EU had been created on a chunk of territory belonging to Kazakhstan and China for trade, uh, which will grow. Uh, the idea is to make it uh, significantly larger in the future. So already in this picture, it starts to look that infrastructure goes together with trade and with the intensification of trade links. Next picture, this is the city of Horgas. Uh, just eight years ago, you can still find Google images on the internet, Horgas did not exist. There was nothing there. It's complete empty steps. And now the city has, has grown. It's already uh, a, a significant city, not by Chinese standards, but certainly by European standards. About half a million people live there already. It is very different from a traditional Chinese city. To me, I say in the book, it looks a bit like a Californian town. Uh, but certainly one of the interesting things that is happening in China today is how concepts of what a city looks like are being rethought. And at some stages in that process, there's some Western influences, but then they are quickly transformed. And we'll see what happens within 10, 20 years. But notice that we're th thinking about infrastructure at first, then about trade. Now we're already considering new cities being born from nothing. And I make this speculative suggestion in my book that perhaps 20, 30 years from now, this will be one of the greatest cities in Central Asia. 
and perhaps an important city in global trade and global connections. Uh, Dubai was also a fisherman's village uh, 40 years ago, and look at it now. Uh, I'm very attracted by the idea of visiting a city while it's still at its initial stages, and then perhaps one can go back in 30 years and say I was here when it was still a small town. And finally, a building in the city of Horgas where you can find uh, signs. This is a, a, a guest house, a modest uh, hotel. Uh, you can find signs uh, not in three languages, but in three different scripts, in Chinese on top, in Arabic script, not Arabic language, but in Arabic script, which is used by the Uyghur minority. I speak Uyghur, a variety of a Turkic language, but the script is Arabic. And then uh, Cyrillic, uh, which was used in Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, in the meantime, has changed to the Roman script. And I like this picture because it shows how the Belt and Road will also become a meeting of cultures, a place new cities are being born, and these are cities where different cultures are meeting, and something new is being created. It's very clear to me that the Belt and Road may start with infrastructure, but goes much beyond infrastructure. What is being created is, in some respects, a new world, with new centers, with new geographies, with new cities, and with a new culture that is also developing. In 2016, um, if you were talking about the Belt and Road in Europe, many people hadn't heard about it, but those who had, had heard about it had the idea of the Belt and Road as being about infrastructure, and in particular about trains. That's not what I was hearing at the time in Beijing when I became interested in the idea and when I started thinking about writing one or two books about it. It was very clear in Beijing that the Belt and Road was about trade and industry and technology. When people described the Belt and Road in Beijing, they didn't talk about trains. They talked about 63 industrial parks that were supposed to open by the end of 2017. And they gave progress reports on what is happening. They talked about the Belt and Road as being a tool for the technological upgrading of the Chinese economy. Much of my experience of the Belt and Road was built around this contradiction, that in Europe I was hearing something rather modest, build tra tra train connections, which perhaps will be more for tourists than anything else, because after all, who wants to transport goods by train from China to Europe? Much more expensive than by sea. But in China, I was hearing a different picture. And when President Xi Jinping uh, introduced the initiative in 2013, he introduced it as being about trade, about people-to-people -people contacts, about economic policy coordination, about financial integration, and about infrastructure, where infrastructure was just one of the five pillars of the initiative. So I started thinking about what the Belt and Road could be at its full development. In my most recent book, I try, and I think the book is different from other books that are available in that respect, I try to forget a little bit about the official discourse uh, of the initiative. I discuss the speeches, but I don't start from the speeches where it was introduced or the policy documents that are available online, sometimes in English, sometimes in Chinese. I try to start from the logic of the initiative. What is it for? And it always seemed puzzling to me that China was investing so much money to create train connections between Europe and Asia. So let's think about why does China have an economic, a global economic plan, a global economic project? Why does China need this? And that's the starting point of the reflection, I think. Now, it seems obvious to me that China is trying to address what, from the perspective of Chinese decision makers, is the main challenge facing China. The fear and the worry that China will be caught in a middle income trap. The worry that China has grown fast until now because it has benefited from technology transfer from the West, it has benefited from low salaries, and it has benefited from fast urbanization. Now, as all these three processes exhaust themselves, salaries in China are already pretty high. If you look at the numbers, they are not that different from salaries in Portugal or Greece. Uh, which is uh, surprising and shocking uh, to some of us. Uh, and of course, technology transfer has already uh, uh, exhausted itself, and urbanization is already facing significant limits in terms of pollution and not only pollution. So what must China do? It must upgrade its economy. It must become technologically advanced. It must move away from low-value industry into high-value technology-intensive industry. Now, can you do this without a global economic plan? I argue that you cannot. 
and let me very briefly tell you the three main reasons why I think the economic future of China depends on the Belt and Road. First of all, you need integrated value chains. If China is going to occupy the high value segments of value chains, well, other countries will have to occupy the low value segments and the value chain will have to be integrated and will have to work smoothly. Certainly infrastructure is part of that. You need highly developed infrastructure for the value chain to work smoothly as it does in Europe between Switzerland and Germany, Austria and Germany, Czech Republic and Germany, and that infrastructure was built in Europe, thinking about those integrated value chains, while China is trying to do the same on a supercontinental scale. If you read the confidential plan about China-Pakistan economic corridor, it's not been made public for good reason, you find out that Pakistan is supposed to become an agricultural economy with some textile industry in low value segments of the textile sector. Why is that the case? Well, if China wants to move away from agriculture even more than it's already done, it needs to buy agricultural products from someone else. Pakistan will be there next to the Chinese border. And low value textiles that can be integrated into supply chains and transform Xinjiang into uh, a, a high value uh, textile industry center and fashion center. Uh, this has not been made public, of course, because uh, there are doubts that Pakistani public opinion would be happy about this. That's the first reason why you need a global economic plan. Second reason, you need markets. If China wants to dominate the technology of the future, imagine the level of investment that is necessary to dominate 5G, self-driving cars, robotics. 5G is already very clear, the level of investment that was necessary, and that Huawei actually uh, put the money up for that. Well, that investment will only have returns if you have access to significant global markets. Huawei will not be successful if it's limited to the Chinese market, African market, and some limited markets in Southeast Asia. It needs to have truly global markets. Well, but in order to guarantee that Chinese companies have access to these global markets, you need to have a global presence. You need to have a foreign policy and a foreign economic policy. You need to be present in this country so that you have leverage and influence over the economic decisions. First reason, value chains. Second reason, markets. Third reason, very quickly, you need to have control over global technological standards. Today, technological standards, the key copyrighted technology, the USB ports in our computers, these were created by Western companies. If you want to build a laptop, you need, of course, to have a USB port. If you have a USB port, you have to pay royalties and licensing fees to the people that created this technology. And the flow of licensing fees and royalties from China to the West is today, of course, measured in close to a trillion dollars every year. Now, think of a world in the future where China has been able to uh, copyright the new technological standards of the future in high-speed trains, in 5G. Huawei is already by far the most significant holder of, the, of technology standards in 5G, with Ericsson uh, being second. Uh, well, again, you need a global economic plan to make sure that this happens, because these votes uh, take place in international bodies where different countries have different voting rights and different companies have different voting rights. You need a global economic presence to make sure that it's your technological standards that are recognized in international bodies as the global technology standards. In a world that may not be that far off, these flows of royalty fees, uh, and licensing fees will be going the other direction, from Europe and America to China and no longer from China to Europe and America. This is a vitally critical issue for European companies and for Chinese companies. And I think this issue explains a lot of what is happening uh, with the wars around Huawei and other wars that will happen in the future. Who will control the key technological standards of the future? So to, to wrap up, uh, China needs a global economic project if it wants to transform its economy into a high technology economy. Uh, in the process, China will become more and more the center of these global economic networks. And then the question that is raised by this last uh, picture presents itself, will the world be different? Uh, in this world, heavily integrated, but where integration is being led by China and where China is at the center, is this going to be just like the world we live in today, but with a different center? Or will China project different economic and political values into this new world? 
And that's the question with which I, I finished my book. Uh, very briefly, I argue, and I, I feel strongly about this, and I feel that there are many other books arguing the opposite, uh, uh, but, but the argument seems to me uh, in the end flawed. I don't believe for a moment that this world led by China, with China at the center, will be similar to the world we live in today. Uh, I provide a very short list at the end of differences that already seem obvious to me. If you research and try to write about the Belt and Road, you realize that the Belt and Road works according to different rules and to different principles. Let me tell you, as I finish, three ways in which it seems very different for me. First of all, the question of transparency. I wrote my book traveling around the different geographies and talking to people. And it doesn't seem to me that there's any other way to write a book about the Belt and Road because the information is not available online. The critical important information is not available online. It's not supposed to be available online. As people tell me in Beijing, you in the West think that you have a right to privacy, that individuals have a right to privacy. Well, we in China think that the Chinese Communist Party has a right to privacy. It's not that different. Uh, and in fact, the idea that uh, important issues of national strategy and national security should not be discussed in public is important and uh, allows us to think of the Belt and Road as a project that is not meant to be transparent. It works according to different levels of clearance. Some people know what it's supposed to, to be and how it's supposed to work. Other people know only what is necessary to implement their part of the project, but they don't necessarily know everything about it. And this is very different from the way we think about these things in the West, where, of course, sometimes transparency is not present, but we're always struggling to increase transparency, and it's recognized as a value. I don't see that it's being recognized as a value in the Belt and Road for reasons that uh, are actively justified by the people in charge. Uh, the second way in which it seems different to me is it is a much more moralized language. You will see in the next few years, you'll, you, you, you can become aware of it, as China uses a heavily moralized language. Countries are supposed to be grateful, or they can be ungrateful. They are supposed to show respect for more important and bigger countries. Um, they can sometimes um, be subject to uh, retribution in a heavily moralized understanding of political and economic relations. Whereas the language we use in the American-led order is much more about honoring your commitments. It's a legal formal language, but not a moralized language. And finally, this is a world, and I'll stop with this, uh, it is in many respects my most vivid impression uh, of the last six months living in Beijing. It is a world of fast technological change. Um, I say in my book that these days the experience of coming from Beijing to Zurich is the experience in some respects of going back in the past. The exact opposite of what travelers in the 19th century talked about, that when they went from Europe to, to China, they felt they were going back in time. Well, now it's a bit like the opposite. Uh, you can't use credit cards in China anymore. You can't use cash. You pay everything with your phone. You get to Beijing airport. There's a uh, facial recognition technology that tells you your, where your gate is. You don't have to enter your ticket number. You show your face, and it tells you how to go to your gate. And the world of the Belt and Road is very much about technological change and fast technological change. The Belt and Road is, in many respects, an instrument meant to accelerate technological change, and in particular, technological change within China. So it's a world where the experience here of seeing a city that didn't exist uh, six years ago and it's becoming more and more an important city, building a robotic sector in Horgas, will be uh, an experience that will repeat itself in the new cities of the Belt and Road. Uh, and I think in many respects, the spirit of the Belt and Road can be captured by this idea of a new city emerging from nothing. The idea of the new, the idea of radical change is at the core of the Belt and Road. And of course, the idea that we may be entering a new world order is also very important and critical for the Belt and Road. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bruno, um, for this introduction, uh, which I think already covered a lot of ground and provided a lot of fodder for discussion. Um, it's now my pleasure, I wanted to say, to invite Agatha Kratz on stage, but she's already here. 
welcome Agatha, um, who she will join Bruno for a first conversation which will explore the, the purpose um, as of raison d'etre for the Belt and Road a little bit further. Um, Agatha is an associate director at Rhodium Group, um, which is a consultancy where she focuses, um, being based in Paris herself, focuses on relations between China and the EU, um, as well as, of course, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is a big part of those uh, relations. Um, she holds a PhD from King's College um, in London, uh, where she wrote about Chinese railway projects um, in the world, so outside of China, uh, many of them part of the Belt and Road, um, and previously also worked for the European Council for Foreign Affairs, Asia and China program. So with that, I'm handing over to you, Agatha, and to you, Bruno, for the first conversation. Um, one last note, um, if you can't really read this map be um, because it's too far away or the uh, resolution is not good enough, there's also a copy um, in the maps that you were given um, if you want to follow along on a map. Please, Agatha Perfect. and Bruno. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for having invited me today. I'm very happy to be here. Very glad to be uh, moderating our discussion here. Uh, Thank you for your keynote speech, uh, which really put the great picture, big picture out there uh, for everyone here. Um, I think a nice way to start the conversation and this long conversation uh, would be to take a step back, back to 2013, back to Kazakhstan, uh, back to um, that first speech by Xi Jinping, which announced the Belt and Road Initiative, and actually pretty much the belt without the road part of it yet, um, as the really starting point, official starting point for the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and in that context, if we think back to 2013, I want to ask you and I want to um, ask you to provide us a little bit of context about what are the conditions, um, what is the domestic situation in China, international situation in China, um, what is the broad context for the emergence of that idea of a Belt and Road Initiative? Mm -hmm. Can you explain to us what are the roots, what are the principles that pushed Xi Jinping that one day of 2013 to announce the initiative, both at home and abroad? Uh, that would be great. Yes. Um, I think there are, the, the, there are two or three um, obvious places to start. Um, First of all, when you ask in Beijing who was the intellectual forefather of the initiative, of course, many people will tell you that it was uh, Xi Jinping himself, and, and it's difficult to, to move beyond that. But uh, a name that, that, that pops up quite a bit is uh, Wang Jisse. Uh, and he's a foreign policy scholar who argued, with some prescience, one has to admit, in, in 2010, 2012, that China was on the way to a big confrontation with the United States uh, and that it should prepare for that. And one way of preparing for that was to turn the other way, um, that the confrontation would happen in the Pacific and China should look the other way, both to try to avoid that confrontation, which was not in China's interest for the time being, at least, uh, but also to find uh, alternative markets and alternative economic links. Uh, and I think the Belt and Road obeyed that, um, that goal to some extent. Uh, since then, it has found other goals and other purposes, but I think that was present at the beginning. Uh, the second factor that I remember very clearly, Xi Jinping back then was making a lot of speeches uh, just before and after that famous speech in Kazakhstan. Many speeches about how China's foreign policy had to change and become more active or proactive and more aggressive to some extent. Some of you who know China remember that uh, Deng Xiaoping had this idea that uh, China should be modest in its foreign policy goals, not create trouble, uh, wait for a better time to show up in all its glory. Uh, and Xi Jinping deliberately uh, thought that it was time to change that. Now, many people in Beijing and elsewhere think that he may have made a mistake in, in doing it a bit too early. Uh, but that was clearly a part of it, and, and the Belt and Road was meant to signify the moment where China became a major global actor. Uh, these, those two factors, I think, were, were significant back in 2013. And so those are mostly external factors. Um, the U.S. to a certain extent, and then foreign policy, uh, trying to have a more proactive uh, or at least less disguised foreign policy. Mm -hmm. uh, what about domestic factors? Were there strong domestic factors that pushed uh, China to announce the initiative? Uh, there were a number of them. Uh, um, China has had historically uh, difficulties with the integration of uh, the western provinces, Xinjiang. You can see in the map, it's a large province on, on the borders with uh, Kazakhstan, with Russia, with India, with Pakistan. I think uh, Xinjiang has borders with nine countries. Uh, it's really sort of China's window to, to Central Asia, to South Asia, to Russia. 
but uh, with a minority that has been uh, restive with the confrontations uh, happening regularly and of course the story that is ongoing about uh, a, a new attempt to integrate uh, by force uh, this minority. Uh, the Belt and Road was also meant in a way to integrate Xinjiang and further its economic development. Uh, I think that uh, it was obvious to decision makers in Beijing that it's not enough to have subsidies and uh, uh, conditions for Xinjiang's development, that it was also necessary to open Xinjiang to the world. Because that's how China, the, the, the eastern provinces, the seaboard provinces had developed. So if you wanted to use the same uh, strategy for Xinjiang, you needed to open Xinjiang to the world by developing this corridor with Pakistan, by opening connections to Kazakhstan that I talked so much about, and also to Russia. So I think this was important. Uh, and then, of course, the very delicate matter of dealing with social unrest that could follow from the technological upgrading of the Chinese economy. As steel factories close, uh, unemployment goes up. And how to do this in a controlled manner? Because on the one hand, China wants to do this, but on the other hand, it wants to do it in a way that is very different from uh, how it's done in Europe, for example, uh, where it's market-led uh, and very disruptive and socially disruptive. We've seen that over the, next, over the last 10 years in Europe, Southern Europe in particular. China wants to do it in a controlled manner, and the Belt and Road is a way to move some of this uh, heavy industry outside China, but in a controlled, gradual manner as it becomes appropriate and has alternatives for the labor force are created. Absolutely. Um, when the Belt and Road emerged, it was first one belt, one road, and it was all about the, a belt uh, that would be a land-based kind of corridor uh, linking China to Europe, um, and a road, uh, which was to be a seaborne corridor to link mm. China to Europe through Africa. Um, but there was also, in the first few speeches, uh, this idea of six corridors, and there were ideas of 47 countries, and there were ideas about um, different kind of regional associations to the Belt and Road Initiative. So um, almost the trillion dollar question is, it, what is the geographical scope, the actual geographical scope of the Belt and Road Initiative? Is it actually 47 countries or six corridors? Is it broader? Um, yeah, I would love to get your opinion on that. Yes, just as with many other things in my book, I try to abstract a little bit from, from the official discourses and try to look at the logic. And, and the logic seems to me obvious. The Belt and Road is meant to encompass the whole world. That's the reason the name was changed in English, because in Chinese it was never changed. Itai Lu, one belt, one road, it has remained that way. It is very metaphorical in Chinese, uh, but in English it didn't quite work when you called it one belt, one road, because people um, thought and interpreted it as being just uh, one connection by land and one connection by sea. I think it's been explained to me in the State Council in Beijing that by transforming it into belt and road, you made it uh, uh, vaguer, uh, more flexible, more open, uh, and more capable of including different dimensions as it grows. Uh, by the way, in my book, I do something a little bit irreverent. I drop the word initiative. Uh, I don't call it Belt and Road Initiative anymore. I call it Belt and Road. And I see people in Beijing now doing that more and more, because it is, in fact, in my view, larger than a, an initiative. It is a political and economic order uh, so there's been a process of uh, uh, growth. Uh, the initiative has become more expansive. It includes more and more dimensions. And by now, I think it's obvious that it includes um, everything that is happening outside China's borders. Uh, the, the important distinction now seems to be about domestic policy and the Belt and Road, with the Belt and Road capable of including potentially everything, with one exception that Chinese decision makers <laughs> continue to be very worried about the idea that the Belt and Road would also encompass security dimension. Uh, so everything that is happening outside China and that doesn't have to do with the security and the military would naturally fall under the Belt and Road. So would you say the US is included in the Belt and Road? No, uh, <laughs> the US is not included. It's very interesting, you look at this map and uh, the US is not there, right? Uh, and it's kind of convenient, uh, it's on, on the reverse side. Uh, and it's excluded from the Belt and Road. There are two countries that never appear as part of the Belt and Road, only two, really, uh, the United States and Canada. The United States, because let's be honest about this, we're not even in Beijing, so we can be completely honest, the Belt and Road is meant to be a project against the United States, about, against the American-led order. Uh, so the United States is not part of it. Uh, the United States is the target. 
And Canada, I think many people in Beijing regard Canada as being a bit of a dependency of the United States. There's not much hope for Canada. Uh, so Canada and the United States are not included, but every other country potentially has a role to play, certainly in Latin America, where countries have signed memoranda on the Belt and Road, and uh, also Japan. Uh, China continues actively to court Japan, and I sometimes hear in Beijing that Japan will eventually join and will be the second G7 country, uh, with potentially France, they say, being the third. I'm very skeptical about both Japan and China. Uh, both about Japan and, and France, uh, but we'll have to wait and see. But so I, I would say that uh, clearly the, the two countries that are not part of it are, are uh, and the only two, are the United States and Canada. Yeah. So in Belt and Road lingo, if you would call it, especially from Chinese leaders, uh, there's a number of terms um, that from a Western kind of European OECD point of view, whatever you call it, um, seem quite weird the first time you hear them, right? Um, so win-win, mutual benefit, a community of destiny, um, which seem to describe a new Chinese uh, view on foreign policy, a new type of Chinese po foreign policy. Uh, first, how do you characterize those terms? How do you explain them? And more generally, um, what is China's new foreign uh, policy uh, after hiding your strengths? Uh, what's the next stage and what are the main concepts and principles behind it? There's a concept that is always introduced as the intellectual uh, basis of the Belt and Road, and that's the concept of a community of shared destiny. It's an interesting concept, and those uh, students that are writing about uh, political ideas of the future, this is certainly will be one of them that will become more and more uh, knowledgeable about. Uh, community of shared destiny really represents the idea that countries are interdependent. And in that sense, it's not very different from ideas of interdependency that have been developed in the West. And Xi Jinping introduced that idea already in the initial speeches in uh, 2013 in Kazakhstan and Indonesia as being central to the Belt and Road. Um, the United States in particular has uh, objected uh, very strongly to this language of a community of shared destiny. Um, I think on the grounds that it is uh, um, eventually it will culminate in a global order where China is at the center. Um, but I don't think the objection can really be principled because the ideas are very similar to ideas of globalization and ideas of interdependence that have become popular in the West. The problem, it seems to me, is that globalization and interdependence will follow Chinese rules and will follow Chinese influence. Uh, it's very obvious that China understands interdependence as uh, eventually favoring China. This is not in the official documents, but is in many of the academic discussions. That China is making the greatest effort to build this community of shared destiny and should be rewarded for that effort. This is said very openly by Chinese academics. Um, if a community of shared destiny recognizes the, de the mutual dependency that countries have on each other, well, it's very obvious, I think, even to people here in Switzerland, that countries will be more dependent on China than China will be dependent on them, just because of the size. Uh, for the Chinese watch industry, the Chinese market is probably now becoming more and more a question of uh, survival and prosperity. Uh, China will not be as dependent on the Swiss market. In fact, it seems very clear to us now uh, following the news that China is really only dependent on one country, the United States, but it's already at a level where it can uh, very easily disengage from, a, from any other country if it thinks that's uh, appropriate uh, in terms of the behavior this country has shown towards China. Uh, so it's certainly a position where, where China will be um, occupying the commanding heights of the world economy and other countries will be in more subordinate positions. The Belt and Road Initiative has been around for now, what, five, six, seven years, mm -hmm. depending on where you exactly pinpoint the start of the initiative. Um, now, five years in China for you, having lived here, if you lived there myself as well, uh, sometimes seems like 30 years in the, in the West. Uh, I remember when I lived in Beijing, any time I left for two weeks uh, to go travel around China, I came back and half of my street had changed, uh, simply because all of the shops had moved and kind of, you know, there was a new bubble tea place at the place of the pizza place before. Anyway, so five years in China is just a very, very different um, five years than would be um, in Europe in particular. Um, now, the initiative has been around for five years. If I were to ask you what were the two or three key changes or maybe key evolution in the initiative, what would you say there are in terms either of objective, of scope, of um, 
reshaping of the initiative? Yes, that's a good question. I, th I think uh, the changes are very recent, as you would expect, uh, because after a period of discussion, a period of uh, uh, presenting the initiative to different countries all over the world, it started to be implemented with some projects, um, started to be implemented roughly in, in 2015. Uh, if, there, if there has been already a, a level of change, it is quite recent. But I think it's already possible to see it. Um, China has become worried about a number of uh, elements about the Belt and Road and willing to entertain some changes. And in private, people will, will talk about them. Uh, changes about uh, lending standards and credit standards, uh, making them more rigorous and tighter and making sure that some projects that are only being developed for political ends uh, have to be more subordinate to economic returns if the initiative is going to be viable. Uh, I mean, I think people have a misguided understanding of how the Chinese uh, political and economic system works. They think of it as authoritarian, almost in a Soviet style, but that's not how it works. The level of entrepreneurship, political and economic, at a lower level is uh, extraordinary. And in some sense, the authorities at the top have tried to rein it in, because when instructions go on to do something, that something is approved from the top, there are many thousands of volunteers that will rush in and try to show uh, their, their ability so that they can move up. Uh, and so there was a certain l moment when I think authorities felt that they were losing control of it because everyone was rushing in and many projects were being approved without uh, the necessary consideration. That's one level where you could see changes and people, for example, at the AIIB in Beijing tell me that there's been a lot of serious engagement with Chinese authorities about upgrading the lending standards, Chinese banks and the uh, development banks and other credit institutions. And the second area where I see some change and uh, more relevant and more promising is this idea, which I think China was reluctant at first, but it's now starting to accept, that the Belt and Road can be a bit more multilateral, that it can work uh, in a more flexible framework where countries can cooperate between each other without necessarily going through Beijing. The Belt and Road, as it was originally defined, was a framework of bilateral relations between China and 100 or 150 countries, not 70 anymore. Uh, but there was always a possibility that was not explored, but could be explored, of allowing countries to collaborate with each other under the framework of the Belt and Road, but, but with each other. So if uh, Saudi Arabia, which is being considered for this role, wants to invest in Pakistan, perhaps it could invest in Pakistan under the framework of, of the Belt and Road. And that could mean that a, a Saudi company would be financed by a Chinese bank to invest in Pakistan. Or it could mean that a Saudi company would invest in Pakistan and China would help with technical expertise. There are many different possibilities, but I think this is perhaps the most significant change that is happening as we speak, uh, that the initiative is becoming more flexible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was almost Time to the second. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much, and a short round of applause for Agatha and Bruno. And I think from the many from the many things uh, that were mentioned by Bruno, I think the, the one thing uh, that stuck with me, but I think it's um, not being mentioned enough, is really that there's a strong domestic element to the Belt and Road. And I think, in fact, at the beginning, that was very, very important was this um, this desire to develop the, the Western regions. Um, and that's where it all started. So thank you very much, Bruno Mache. So we'll leave the stage for now, but we'll be back at the very end. Um, and Agatha will be joined now um, on the stage uh, by Tseng Xin Li for the second conversation on what has actually happened so far in the Belt and Road. Uh, Tseng Xin Li is the uh, editor for International Business News and an editorial board member uh, at Tseng Media in Beijing, which publishes the, the Tseng Xin um, uh, magazine uh, that you may have seen. It's one of the China's leading business media outlets. Um, he also previously served as their US correspondent. So without much further ado, um, Agatha and Tseng Xin, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Um, I find your code uh, has not got recovered, so uh, just... <laughs> I'll do my best. Try, yeah. Um, so uh, what our objective here is to figure out what ha has already happened, what will happen, right? So, but before that, I, I, I have to say I really admire your work at Rhodium Group, because in, as early as in 2009, uh, their uh, consulting firm published the first series of data of Chinese ODI. 
the, we know how, how hard it is to, to get data in China. And at the time, it was really shocking. And I think your data, your reports has become a uh, standard and all the, uh, uh, even the government bodies uh, quote your data. So uh, already you've, uh, you've talked about what is BRI, but I have to ask this question again, because for you, you need to collect the data, an analyze, analyze those data. So in your, in your mind, what is BRI? <laughs> So, um, yeah, I think in understanding how much has been done over the past five, six years and understanding it, how to pinpoint the realization of the Belt and Road Initiative, it's, it's uh, very, very important to know what we're speaking about. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's very hard to know what you're speaking about um, with the Belt and Road Initiative because not only was the original concept very vague, but the way that it's developed over the past five years uh, is also both uh, exponential uh, and goes in all kinds of directions. So let me give a few examples here. The kind of main policy document that you would, and you, you kind of want to kind of hold on to something that's clear and official and out there uh, that tells you what the Belt and Road Initiative is. Uh, and that's a 2015 document that's called the Action Plan for the Belt and Road Initiative that was released uh, by many of the Chinese uh, ministries three, back then. Three ministries. Exactly, and yeah. see the MOFCOM and um, uh, which was the Ministry of Finance, right? No, the and DRC, foreign, foreign, foreign Ministry, Ministry. Yeah, and of Commerce. And Ministry of Commerce, yeah. under the State Council. Yeah. Um, and so the principle behind that document was to say, okay, what, what do we speak about, you know, two years after Xi Jinping's speech, what do we speak about when we speak about the Belt and Road Initiative? Mm -hmm. And so it's 17 pages of trying to, def to define the Belt and Road Initiative, and it's 17 pages of uh, great vagueness to a certain extent. You've got uh, objectives in there from promoting world peace uh, to promoting Asian economic development uh, to actually standardizing um, exactly how rail gauges should work uh, to uh, aligning financial uh, institution, financial principles across Belt and Road countries. So you've got a flurry um, of objectives in there. You've got a flurry of a, a great motivation in there um, that range very, very widely and don't really, really help um, when you Try and develop, or yeah, we have a lot, a lot of plans define. Like, just like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> define, uh, define. So it's it's very it's very inductive, and it's, it's it's quite a it's quite a Chinese approach. I would understand that you know you you leave it open so that people can actually join and. Pro promote and propose their own definition. And this is exactly what happened, actually, because uh, as soon as 2014, 15, 16, you've got a number of actors that have then tried to add to their own definition of the Belt and Road Initiative. So for example, you've got ministries who publish their own Belt and Road uh, plans. Um, trying to translate the Belt and Road into ministerial plans. So you've got the Ministry of Commerce that had a Belt and Road uh, plan. You've got the Ministry of Science and Technology, which had a, a Belt and Road plan, and the way that they were seeing how the uh, Belt and Road should be implemented. Uh, you had offshoot projects uh, over the next few years. You had a digital Silk Road. You had agricultural co cooperation as part of the Silk Road. Uh, you had technological cooperation as part of the Silk Road. You've got the 2017 uh, standardization law that speaks about the Silk Road. So you've got a number of policy documents that kind of add to the picture but broaden it even further uh, from the 2015 document, right? Um, and on top of this, and beyond official dumb, uh, because this is an inclusive context, because uh, the approach, the Chinese approach, is for everyone to bring in their own tiny little stone to the uh, Belt and Road edifice, you've got all kinds of actors that seeing how ambitious uh, the initiative was, uh, wanted to propose their own definition. So you've got provinces all of a sudden joining in and saying we want a Belt and Road plan for Xinjiang, uh, we want a Belt and Road plan for uh, Sichuan, we want a Belt and Road plan even for the coastal region where you would think the Belt and Road is actually a western type of thing, but all coastal region now coming up with a plan saying that they are the end of the Belt and Road initiative, mm -hmm. uh, starting to develop their own plan. Uh, on top of this, um, you've got academics joining in, uh, writing a million, uh, and that's actually not a joke, more than a million academic papers. Uh, one of my favorite one is the one about why air conditioning should be uh, included in the Belt and Road Initiative. It's peer reviewed and it's available out there. And it's Chinese academic making the point that air conditioning is a crucial part of the Belt and Road Initiative. You've got boxing matches, uh, boxing uh, games uh, being included in the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, you've got even non-Chinese actor now now wanting to be part of the definition of the Belt and Road Initiative. You've got countries such as Afghanistan, which in 2016 said, I want to be part of the Belt 
and Road Initiative. Uh, and the Chinese has said, that wasn't the plan, but okay, <laughs> join in, let's go for it. Uh, so you've got a number of countries that, hearing, hearing about the Belt and Road Initiative, say, we, we, we'd love to be part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, you've got a number of uh, foreign companies also saying, uh, you know, uh, Chinese companies are part of it, but we're, we're an international bank, and we have a Belt and Road Fund, uh, and can we join in? Uh, so anyway, just an inflation of definition, an inflation of actors, an inflation of motivation, which makes it extremely hard to pinpoint exactly uh, what has been done so far in the Belt and Road. Yeah, so when you do your research, how do you, how do you see um, this is BRI, that is not how, what kind of standards are you following? Uh, so it all depends about what you want to get from your analysis um, and what you want to compare it to, uh, mm -hmm. very simply. Do you want to speak about infrastructure projects? Right. You know, if you want to define very, very strictly uh, the Belt and Road as the construction of a number of hard and soft infrastructure projects throughout the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that's your gauge to measure it against, and if you want to compare that to what the US does in the world, to what the EU does in the world, to what the ADB finances, the World Bank finances, then that's one way to look about it. So if you look at that, for example, and we compile the number, and that was one of the way to say, okay, let's start somewhere. We're not going to be able to define everything, but let's start somewhere and let's see what happened there. Uh, what we did is we mapped a uh, number of uh, financing and a number of projects, and we came up with a number that is about 50 billion having been lent per year by China's policy banks. Uh, mm -hmm. So not any commercial bank, but China policy banks, which are uh, the Export Import Bank of China, the China Development Bank, for big, chunky contracting uh, projects throughout mm -hmm. the world. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a total now of 250, 270 billion of financing expended uh, and extended to a uh, hard infrastructure project. Mm -hmm. uh, those financing um, so are the, one part of the These documents picture. are public, right? You, you yeah, can absolutely. Okay. Those are actually, yeah. um, you know, using both our research, our cross-referencing, and then some Chinese numbers uh, published by Mofcom. Mm -hmm. um, but now, of course, if you add to that, you know, a number of, um, a number of actors in China will tell you, well, uh, Belt and Road Initiative is also direct investment. It's not just lending. Uh, it's not just infrastructure projects. It's all kind of uh, outward investment into the world. Then you need to extend your uh, definition. How much has China uh, invested uh, outside of China over the past few years? Well, at the peak of 2016, it was about 100 billion per year of outward direct foreign investment. Now. It all depends again, and this is the problem with definition. Do you look only at Belt and Road countries? Do you look only at developing countries? Or do you look at the whole wild world? If you take only Belt and Road countries, that's actually closer to 12, 15 billion per year going into Belt and Road countries, a total of 60 billion, uh, at least according to Mofcom number. But if you look at the whole world and you start deciding that a brewery in Czech Republic is a very good <laughs> sign of Belt and Road investment, um, then you might go further in terms of developing. And then on top of this, you've got to include or you've got to think about, and I think uh, Bruno's presentation was excellent about that, you need to think about non-financial aspects of the Belt and Road Initiative, because it's an economic initiative, but it's also a political initiative, it's a, a strategic initiative. And so uh, you could start counting other things. You could start counting uh, cooperation agreements, uh, agricultural cooperation agreement, standard uh, cooperation agreement, agreement for fisheries, uh, and all kinds of um, cooperation mechanisms that have been put in place. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's really, when you, when you try and define the Belt and Road Initiative, you just need to know what you want to compare it to. Mm -hmm. You need to know where you want to start, and you need to know uh, how useful and what is the use of the number you're going to make. Yeah, that, does counting really matter? Or should we keep counting or, or not? Well, once again, if you want to make a decision or if you want to know, for example, how much trade the Belt and Road generated, mm -hmm. um, then yes, it's important because you want to know if there was a political effect, if really uh, the initiative in itself created more projects, it created more trade than um, was the trend line up until then. Uh, if you want to know, for example, if Belt and Road projects, if uh, Chinese companies are taking up market shares uh, from Western uh, contractors, for example, or companies, it's important to be able to count how much of the project they got, how many of them uh, throughout the world uh, they produced. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to count or if you want to compare uh, China as a development actor or um, uh, developmental, yeah, a developmental actor and financer compared to the World Bank, compared to what Europe finances uh, throughout the world, then it's important to know how much they lent, at which condition, mm -hmm. uh, and to which countries. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it is important, but I think you can't compare one trillion being in the press uh, and take that as granted um, and just apply that to everything. You need to know exactly what you count. Mm -hmm. According to your own data, uh, China's outbound ODI uh, dropped a, quite a bit uh, last year. Yeah. So uh, did that also happen to BRI ODI? 
No, so actually, um, it's good that you pointed out. Chinese investment last year, outward foreign direct investment, dropped uh, across the board, um, and especially to the US and to the EU. Mm -hmm. um, if you take the total of China's outward uh, foreign direct investment last year, it was down uh, almost 40% from the peak of 2016. 2016 was really the peak year for Chinese outward direct investment. In Europe, it was 50% down from the 2016 levels, uh, at least according to our numbers. Uh, and in the US, it was 90% down from the 2016 uh, numbers. And actually, if you counted this investment, and we've got um, a little bit of a methodological uh, detail here, which we can speak um, at the coffee break about. Um, if you counted the investment, actually, there would have been net investment from the US in 2016, uh, in 2018 um, from China. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the one place where Chinese investment is holding up uh, is actually to developing countries. So once again, depends how do you, defi do you define the Belt and Road Initiative. If you think Europe is part of it, then there's a fall in uh, Chinese outward investment. But if you take uh, Belt and Road as developing countries, and especially of Asia, uh, Africa, and uh, potentially Latin America, um, then there was holding up a decent, very decent holding up mm -hmm. of outward investment from China. Mm -hmm. For uh, usually, or often, many times, people missed up. At least our readers, uh, sometimes they think that China build a bridge, or you know, the BOT build operating and transfer uh, uh, model. They think that's investment. Actually, that's, yeah. that's not right. Yeah. So, uh, in that aspect, what's happening right now? So that's a very, very good um, distinction to make. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at infrastructure, and if you look at infrastructure as one of the very key pillars of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, then most of what China does in terms of infrastructure for the moment in Belt and Road country is lending for what you call EPC project. Mm -hmm. So engineering, procurement, and construction. That means Chinese companies being subcontracted uh, to build a bridge or to build a road or to build a railroad, but they're not investing, they're being paid for it. And the way they're being paid for it in most cases is China as, um, as I said, policy bank, so mm -hmm. the Chinese state lending uh, to a Belt and Road state for that Belt and Road state to then finance the infrastructure. So it's a whole kind of very nice triangular relationship uh, where China gives the country money, the, con the, um, the money is being used to build um, a railroad, a railroad which is uh, built by Chinese companies. Yeah. And most of the Belt and Road activity so far, in infrastructure at least, right. has been a lot about EPC. The money doesn't need to go to that country at all. It doesn't it's even need to go. From me to you, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And sometimes the money even stays within China. <laughs> yes. So, uh, uh, so far, uh, so many projects and so, so much money invested. So far, do you think BRI is a success or a failure? So I often, um, very often say that um, a, lot of, a lot of the Belt and Road Initiative is about PR. It's about public relations. Because if you look at what China was doing before 2013 and what it announced that it would do after 2013 with the Belt and Road Initiative and the action plan, it's pretty much the same. So building infrastructure, building road, investing abroad, um, lending and financing uh, all kinds of mining and uh, productive projects, even uh, business uh, centers in uh, special economic zones. That was all part of the plan and that was all happening before 2013. What's the difference in 2013? What changes is the rhetoric about it. It's China saying, OK, we're going to put a name on what we've been doing for so many years, and we're going to make it look, or we're going to try and project the image of uh, China as a beneficial partner, benevolent developer, uh, someone who can be a partner to so many developing, across, uh, developing countries across the world in their own, uh, in their own pursuit of development in their own pursuit of modernization, infrastructure upgrading, etc. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you look at the past, or the first five years of the initiative, if you look at 2013 up to the very end of 2017, um, the results were great, to be honest. There was very few, there were very few parts of the world where people hadn't heard about the Belt and Road Initiative. Most countries around the world mm -hmm. had heard about uh, that great initiative that China was putting on the table for the 21st century. And uh, most governments, <laughs> most um, journalists you met um, knew that China was wanting to finance infrastructure, finance mm -hmm. all kinds of projects mm -hmm. throughout the world. And most countries were really welcoming of that, especially developing countries, uh, once again, um, because, well, they were short of funds for uh, investment, short of funds for financing. Uh, and also, you know, who wouldn't, who wouldn't take a trillion dollars their ways if, if it did come their way? Um, now, it changed a lot in 2018, right? Because mm -hmm. in 2018, you saw a series of countries, Malaysia first, uh, but not only countries such as Zem such countries such as Nepal, Myanmar, mm -hmm. uh, even Pakistan to a certain extent. What happened? Why? Um, Why? Saying, 
saying they weren't so welcoming of the initiative anymore. Mm. It all started to me, it all started with uh, the Hamambota port. Uh, I don't know if you would call it yeah, incident yeah, or anything, yeah, but Lanka. what happened is uh, China lent to uh, Sri Lanka, um, in part for the construction of a port, but for a flurry of other projects, not just the port construction. Uh, and when Sri Lanka found itself in a situation where it couldn't pay back, uh, the deal that was uh, passed between the two countries mm -hmm. uh, was that a Chinese company would take over control of the port for 99 years, uh, very simply. Uh, which isn't something that has never happened in the whole history of infrastructure, of course, mm -hmm. but was a very, very strong signal, uh, both in Europe, in the US, but also throughout the world, uh, among public opinions, among governments, uh, to be much more careful about Chinese uh, lending, lending conditions, condition. And so right after that, you had a Malaysian election uh, with Mahathir being elected in, uh, in Malaysia, who said, well, we need to be more careful, at least. We need to review the terms. We need to see if we didn't sign anything that granted the control of a port or the control of a very strong kind of piece of critical infrastructure to China. Um, and we need to renegotiate, because if we find ourselves in a situation where we can't pay bad debt, this is something that might happen to us. And this is actually what happened in Myanmar as well. In Myanmar, you had a huge 10 billion uh, port project uh, that had been brewing for a number of years with China. And um, the same year, 2018, Myanmar said that they wanted to scale down dramatically the project because they wouldn't be able to pay for it and they wouldn't be able to sustain the debt that was attached to it. So once again, countries realizing because of the Sri Lankan port mm -hmm. uh, and the bad press around the Sri Lankan port that they needed to be careful. Mm -hmm. And on top of this, of course, all across the world, opposition parties, especially well, in democratic uh, countries, um, starting to hold this as an election uh, element. In Zambia, opposition parties, opposition press saying um, what the government is doing now in Zambia is actually putting, it, putting us in a debt trap with China and we need to be careful about it. So China and Chinese lending becoming a political element that was extremely, Poison. extremely strong, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But, but I think to, to the Chinese defense, they are saying at the beginning we didn't want that port to be rented to us. We want them to pay back. But yeah. then, then, then they couldn't. Then we negotiated to such a deal that. But uh, but in many Western, you know, uh, commentators, China intentionally that you get a bad debt. Then we will take that. Right? Absolutely. And to be completely honest, um, we had a we had a, a project where we looked at. Chinese debt renegotiation. Uh, okay. So we took 25 countries, we took 30, 30, 35 cases of debt renegotiation. The only two cases where we could find an asset being swapped or an asset being seized by China was Sri Lanka and one case in Tajikistan. Mm -hmm. In all other cases, there had been renegotiating, refinancing, debt rollover, some debt relief, uh, some debt complete debt write-off in some cases. Uh, and Sri Lanka was only really the only case where that happened um, that, we could, that we could find. Now, if, as I said earlier, if uh, Belt and Road is a PR exercise, then one uh, bad seed uh, can just blow it up uh, for, uh, for you. And this is what happened in 2018, and this was a huge blow. And I think uh, the initiative is due to change very profoundly because of that. All right. Just one last question. Right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> very quick. <then. laughs> what needs to be done to change this sentiment, this momentum in your, in your eyes? So I'll be super quick. Uh, fewer projects, higher quality, and much more recipient country integration in the decision making. Asking countries what they want and actually being more in a dialogue than being in a one-way street, I think. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Agatha, thank you, Sanchez. <laughs> A lot of very good insights from Agatha, and I think the one thing to, to remember which is really striking is how much of the Belt and Road conversation has changed in the last 12 months. So 2018, by all intents and purposes, was not a great year uh, for Belt and Road and Belt and Road uh, PR. Um, we are now moving to um, our third conversation and the last before the coffee break, um, and Tsingchen is joined on stage by Marcus Hermann um, to talk about the view on the Belt and Road from China. Uh, Marcus is a director at Synolytics, uh, which provides uh, political China consulting. He's also a former visiting fellow um, at the Berlin-based Mercator Institute for China Studies, which made this beautiful map here and graciously agreed to let us use it. Um, and he's the co-head of the Asia program at the Swiss Forum for Foreign Policy, or FORAUS. Um, and with that, over to you, Marcus and Tsenshin, for the third round. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let, <coughs> let's make best use of, uh, use of the time. Uh, I think one uh, good news that I have for you, Zhang Xin, 
you can talk about anything because you talk about the Chinese view. So you can duplicate what Bruno and, and Agatha has been saying because right. you will offer the Chinese perspective. Okay. And I also want to start with uh, what Nico is encouraging. So if we start with a big disagreement, it big, maybe it brings uh, more energy into the room just ahead of the coffee break. So if I read the, the 2015 Visions and Actions uh, document, my sense is if you read it, uh, and I recommend the read to everyone in this room, it's just 17 or 15 pages yeah. or so. Um, I think it says already everything about the Belt and Road. Because it says, first of all, uh, it talks about the funding mechanism, what are the actors in the, in the funding. Um, it talks about uh, transnational industrial policy, that's, uh, that's basically what Bruno talked about in terms of a global economic plan. It talks about the global scope, it's very honest, it talks about uh, Asia, Europe, uh, Africa and everyone else. Um, it also, uh, and I think it's very telling, in whom does it endorse? If you read through it, which regional organizations, which initiatives is it endorsing? It's only endorsing those initiatives that are China influenced or China dominated or, has a, or China, where China has a big share of, uh, of influence. As an example, SEO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So my question to you, just to start off this, this one, um, what do you think about that document? Is, that, is it very foundational? And also, because you mentioned it earlier, it was published by three ministries. Yeah. What is the reason? Why has it been published by three ministries? So yeah. what does that tell us for a Western uh, observer of the situation? Yeah, yeah. so uh, I think this, this is one of the area I may differ from Bruno. I think this uh, 2015 uh, document is two years after Xi had made those two speeches in Indonesia and, uh, and Kazakhstan. And also you will see that um, uh, the, the three this is not issued by the state uh, state council. This is not issued by the central party uh, commission. It's issued by the uh, commerce, MOFCOM, commerce uh, ministry, uh, foreign affairs, and also uh, and DRC. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I think intentionally they play down this a little bit. They 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 would know they would know that this this could stir some argument. And also, please do remember that in 2013, the biggest thing for China or for the party is not the, the BRI initiative uh, coming out mm -hmm. uh, from nowhere. It, it is the uh, third plenum of the 18th Party uh, Congress. Right? They they roll out this big reform plan. In that, I, I still remember the day, the night we were all working overnight to try to analyze those documents. That document is huge, and only two sentences refer to this Belt and Road. At the time, it was not a Belt and Road. Mm. Uh, I think the, that, that plan uh, is, at the time when Xi uh, brought this up, and, and also Premier Li Keqiang went to some countries and, and talked about that, at the time, they don't have a real plan on that. Uh, after two years, the three ministries, they have this plan, but they don't want to, they, they want to play up the economic side, but play down the geopolitics. Geopolitical side. Yes. Okay. And then I'll just make a pivot to another, to another topic, because when we now um, think about Silk Road, we mm -hmm. always think about the Chinese initiative. Yep. But actually in 2011, there was a speech delivered by the former State Secretary Hillary Clinton, mm -hmm. and she, she talked about the new Silk Road, but referring to Afghanistan at yep. its core. Yep. Uh, what is the Chinese BRI view on what the US was trying to do? Yep. Uh, 2011, I think uh, she, she made that speech in India, right? And uh, she also uh, uh, talked about uh, Pakistan and other Central Asia uh, countries. I think to, to uh, Chinese eyes, uh, first, it's not noticed so well there. And <laughs> second, it's part of the, uh, part of the uh, pivoting to, to, to Asia, right? Mm -hmm. So that, 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 that kind of thought also includes the TPP. But as we know that the uh, Hillary uh, Silk, Silk, New Silk Road didn't start didn't go anywhere. And the TPP, one uh, the United States put out, actually right now in China, the debate is that the new reduced version of CPTPP, China should join that. Uh, that's, uh, you know, at the time China has this RCEP, right, RCEP uh, to, to counter that TPP, but now it's the, the, the debate has changed. And also another misunderstanding or misconception is that some Chinese or even uh, uh, international scholars, they think Silk, uh, Silk Road is, is China. It, but actually uh, Silk Road was never China and will not be, be China because the, the first phrase was brought up by 
by a German geographer called, I forgot his name, in, in 1870, right? So he was describing that, uh, that trade route. But actually in ancient China, I think 140 BC or something, the Han missionary Zhang Qian, he went to the Central Asia not because of uh, trade or commercial, he wants the, the, that country to combat, uh, to, set, uh, to form an alliance with, with, with the Han dynasty to fight the Han the, uh, the, 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 from the northern part. And he was detained by, by, by that country for 10 years. And after he went back, nothing happened. And the, the Silk Road in history actually is Central Asian, Eurasian thing. I think it's, 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 it's not a, a Chinese thing. So it's a um, global public good or regional yeah, public good? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would like you to comment on something that Bruno was talking about, because the transition mm -hmm. of uh, Belt and Road being an academic concept, Professor Wang Ji you mentioned, mm -hmm. and then becoming a policy concept. And mm -hmm. I think this transition is very interesting. Mm -hmm. how, how, how much has it been, how broadly has it been discussed in, in academia, and mm -hmm. how much was the influence of academia in, in making it a policy concept? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, Wang Yixi, uh, of course, he is a very influential scholar, and he's really good. But actually, maybe before and around his, his time, there are many other scholars, uh, uh, including Justin Min Yifu. He was saying this in 2009, when he was the chief economist at the World Bank. He's saying, oh, maybe we, knew, we need a new Marshall Plan for Africa. Uh, he was saying that because China's labor cost was, was, was going up and the demographic dividend is disappearing, we should move some of these uh, industries into that uh, huge con continent. And later on, uh, uh, Xu Shanda from the Ministry of Finance, and uh, at the time when he said this, he was a CPC, uh, CPPCC member. He was also saying the Marshall Plan. Uh, but later on, uh, the decision makers think, oh, that's not sensitive. That's not sensitive enough. That's, they are not sensitive enough. They, they should not say Marshall Plan because there is some ideology inside that. <laughs> um, but uh, also, uh, another point I want to make is that BRI is not a sudden thing. It's, it's, it's like China has been concerned with the Western part of its country for so long. That's because that's why we have Go West in 2001. Yeah. That's Jiang Zemin. Then we have Go Out. Uh, for yeah. the Hu and the Wen uh, uh, administration. If you see China, China is more like a two country, right? The coastal eastern part, the per capita GDP of, of $20,000, that's a high income country. But in the western part, you have the 70% of land mass, 28% uh, of population, you have 20% of GDP. So western part, the economic development, the, the imparity between the, the east and west has always been a, a big concern for, for the decision makers. Maybe just briefly, but building on what you're already exploring, can you just add a, a couple of internal domestic reasons? Because Agatha was already, uh, we were already talking about, uh, when she was speaking to Bruno, mm -hmm. about external reasons, pivot yep. to Asia, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, currency reserves, uh, excess capacity, these are things we hear. Mm -hmm. are, are, these, are these driving basically Chinese, um, the Chinese rationale for Belt and Road? Yeah, I think uh, all, all, all the things you were talking about uh, uh, are important to, to China. But uh, I, I think BRI is foremost uh, from its domestic need, right? Uh, in two, we, we all know in 2010, China became the, the second largest, uh, largest economy. And China needs to transform from a, a uh, export and uh, investment driven growth to a domestic consumption led growth. And also in 2014, China became a net out, uh, capital outflow country, right? Now this year, I think China will be a current account deficit country. Mm -hmm. So China grew so fast in the past, and uh, it suddenly make this, all these turning points together. And it, it was slower to, it was slow to adjust to this. I think the uh, exporting the overcapacity is only a, a, a bad product of this process. We can, we can call it a BRI, we can call it R, RBI or, or anything, but Chinese companies, Chinese people, Chinese are going out and we'd, we'd rather we, we either just, uh, you know, uh, welcome it and try to change it for, for better, or we cannot stop this. Yeah, so yeah. in all dimensions, like foreign yes. policy and, and okay. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about connectivity as a, as a concept? Because the, the EU has, in its uh, connectivity strategy, has defined connectivity 
uh, but my sense of China and Bruno was uh, starting, it's not just about railways, there's these five dimensions, yeah. right? But how sophisticated is the Chinese concept of connectivity? Yeah. Uh, I totally uh, agree with Bruno. <laughs> connectivity means not only roads, not only uh, uh, bridges and ports, but also 5G, telecoms, and information flow, and all, all these things, capital, of course. Uh, but but uh, let's say it started from in infrastructure, right? And, and its top priority or the biggest part is still roads and ports. Because in China, we have this saying, Yao xiang fu xian xiu lu. It's just to get rich, you have to have roles at, 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 at first. Uh, the, just now we were talking about this Beijing-Shanghai high-speed rail, right? So uh, that, that was 10 years ago when Liu Zhijin was the minist railway ministry. And uh, the conventional theory is that um, high-speed rail will be uh, economically uh, you know, viable only if that's within 500 kilometers. At the time, our magazine, our organization were also quoting experts, criticizing and, uh, you know, we are taking a back uh, another wheel on, on this. But now we can see that Beijing, Shanghai, high speed, w was very profitable and going public to be the first. So in, in, in Chinese decision makers and business people, they have this kind of mind that uh, you need to leave some space or you need to build with some a little bit of overcapacity, then it will fill up by itself. That, that's China's experience, you know, because usually we have a road, then three years ago, uh, later the road was too crowded. But that may not apply to Central Asia or other places. Okay. Um, Maybe a little bit on governance, because we spoke about one of the changes uh, of, of the BRI along this first period, uh, mm -hmm. it becoming more multilateral. And there's a BRI tribunal, there's BRI, uh, the, 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 the summit meeting, there's the bilateral uh, approaches. Um, what do you think, and I, I heard the comment of where's the BRI telephone number, so basically whom do you call <laughs> if you have a, a, a BRI question. So what is your sense of the level of uh, self-organization that this initiative or, or uh, it, it needs? Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, there are so many uh, sayings that uh, they don't know wh which department or, or, or ministry to go. I think maybe at, at this, uh, this stage, it was the, 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 it was that by design or, or intentionally leave it mm. as that. As, as I said, it's always the domestic need that drives these kind of initiatives. One day, one, if you have IP issues, we, no, China set up new IP courts, right? If you have other issues, then we can, we can discuss in the a, in a frame, framework. I, I think uh, China is relatively new to the global stage. Mm. ODI, outbound investment, there is a learning curve. And one day when they find out that uh, our current structure, our current institutions cannot figure, cannot solve these problems correctly or efficiently, then they may have to do that. And also another concern is that you have these kind of bodies. They will say you are, you are having another standard. You are, you know, having a new system mm -hmm. and competing with the US. Yeah. Now, you being from um, a media organization and, yep. uh, of course, on the ground in China, yeah. what, what do you report about when you uh, report about the BRI in, uh, to your domestic audiences, mm -hmm. let, let's say on Taishin, not on the Taishin global side, um, and what do people generally think? I mean, yeah. Just the people yeah, yeah. who are interested maybe what China's foreign policy is doing. Yeah. Just now we were talking that uh, <laughs> actually we didn't uh, cover this area enough. It's, it's, it's like we, we never wrote an article or make a cover story labeled as BRI. What happened to BRI? We, we didn't do that. Uh, again, we, 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 have, we have specific topics, specific reporters, and uh, who's really good at energy reporting, uh, reporting on, on energy transportation, uh, finance, and things. When only that happens to, uh, uh, incident happens outside China, but has implications in China and, and the things that we, we, we will report on that. And also I think uh, um, although there are so many uh, problems, they, they didn't, the decision makers themselves may uh, not realize that how serious these uh, problems outside when we see are. Because uh, on these high level meetings, at least from our side, we didn't see them bring up these problems. Mm. Yeah. Okay. One concept that I'm very interested in, and Bruno talked about it, is this Randemi in Gontonti, so this shared future yeah. uh, for, for mankind. So, uh, can you talk about your perspective? How much has that um, 
how much is it already guiding the thinking and how much has it trickled to something concrete that ba basically maybe affects your life or affects more policy making? How is yeah. that from China? Yeah, we will all say that uh, China abandoned or Xi Jinping abandoned this Tao Huang Yang Hui, right? Uh, just hide your ambition, bide your time. Things. I, I think, I think um, uh, of course, this comes from his personal personality, but also as from the fact that China cannot hide anymore. China has already become an elephant. You cannot hide behind others, right? Your policy becomes the world policy. Your policy doesn't only affect yourself. But, but the others. I think, again, um, uh, last week we, we had this China Development Forum in Beijing. There was a topic very interesting. Uh, is, uh, they discussed about uh, Chinese dream and US and American dream, mm -hmm. right? So uh, there was a, this Columbia professor, he's saying, uh, uh, American dream is individual dream. Uh, Chinese dream is a collective dream. No, my, my, my colleagues and I are saying, no, wrong. He messed up Chinese government and, ch and Chinese people. Chinese people have the similar dreams of American, uh, have the similar dreams of the Europeans. They want good life for themselves, better lives for their children. That's, that, that's, that's really the same. Well, why was the first time I was in the United States? I heard this 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 concept of uh, 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 surplus uh, uh, savings cloud by Ben Bernanke. At the time, uh, savings cloud is that China saves too much, then China lends to the United States, which contributes to the to the sub crisis. I was angry. I know it is true. But the thing is, China was sacrificing. China was undervaluing its currency, sacrificing its environment, sacrificing its people's health to make the United States their people to to have uh, cheap goods, necessities on the shelves of Walmart. Then we got the blame, right? So it's uh, and, and John Thornton was saying that, uh, hey, imagine China is rising, and uh, if China one day become the United States, every ten people have eight cars, uh, we will destroy our planet. Mm -hmm. then, then, in Chinese, we, why can't, can, cannot we do that again? Why you are obliged, you can do that, we cannot. And then China started to clean up its, its air, right? So it's uh, and also a, a big shift, I, I think, right now for us is our readers change. For those who were born after the uh, 85, 1985 or 90s, they, they don't have a re memory of Tiananmen Square. Mm. They don't have a memory of hyperinflation in the early 90s, right? They don't even know what was the financial crisis had hit their families because their parents are SOE employees who were laid off, mm. right? They, they were born affluent. They were more open-minded. They were more interconnected. They want to be treated equally, if not superiorly. And to be frank, sometimes uh, the Western part or the, the current global uh, system didn't treat China so well because in 2008 or 2009, uh, China, the, the MF, we, we can see that from MF and the World Bank reform. It took US five years to approve that, right? Um, even the recent Boeing 737 incident, China was among one of the first to ground all these airplanes than all the uh, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and uh, financial, financial Times all imply that China may have some political incentive after this. But they don't remember that China has, for the past 10 years, China has no single passenger airplane crash. So, you know, for the younger generation, sometimes they think they, are, they did their better. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. I just want to, maybe we're running out of time, but I want to add, one. we're sitting in a leading international bank, so yeah. I just want to read one sentence from the Visions and Actions Plan to yeah. you and, and ask you to comment. It says, we should give full play to the role of the Silk Road Fund and that of sovereign wealth funds of countries along the Belt and Road, mm -hmm. and encourage commercial equity investment funds and private funds to participate in the construction of key projects to, of the initiative. So this sounds like a big invitation for co-funding in the BRI. How, how do we have to read yeah. This, this sentence. Yeah, we, we have to, uh, for this sentence, we have to uh, th see the time, the time sequence, because for the action plan, it was uh, March uh, 2015, right? And the Silk Road found was uh, 
a forty forty billion dollar fund, right? Then it was formed in uh, late December fourteen at the time, and the, the shareholders are uh, PBOC's safe state administration of foreign exchanges and just two policy banks. So this is, a, and the chairman was a former assistant uh, PBOC governor. So this is this was the PBOC initiative. Then at the time, AIB, it was already it was was only an idea, right? Then later, then after this, we come by by mid seventeen. Uh, it has invested in uh, six billion USD projects. Uh, I think in uh, Pakistan, in some hydropower and electricity projects, uh, a few Central Asian and South Asian countries. Then we have AIB because AIB has uh, better experiences dealing with infrastructure, and uh, that is from the finance ministry. Right. Okay. I see okay. you moving. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, again, Thanks. right on time. Uh, Tseng Shin, you can actually stay. Oh, you, you may stay. Um, thank you very much, Tseng uh, and Marcus. Um, it is now time. Um, no, maybe first, um, thank you so much for, for sharing all those insights. And I think the one thing, uh, there's so many things. Um, I, I think we tend, to, we tend to sort of view as China as this monolithic block where like uh, the government and business and everybody kind of like is in sync. And, and, and I think you make clear that that's, that that's definitely not the case also when it comes to um, uh, the BRI. So it is now before we break for coffee time for our first audience Q&A. We'd like to ask uh, both Agatha and Bruno um, uh, to join Sanction here on stage. We don't have enough chairs, so you're going to have to yeah. stand, but it's going to make everything more dynamic. Um, it's great. <laughs> Um, so we have. Um, uh, oh, and by the way, Marcus, Marcus uh, will will come back after after the break for more, and you can ask him questions too um, um, in, in in the second part. So we have microphones in the room. If you have a question, please raise your hand. And also, the two things that we always say when it's come to audience questions: one, please keep them short, and please have it be a question. Um, so, uh, and, and and please let us know if you want to address it to a, a specific speaker. Then, and, and please let us know. Um, so there's one right in the middle. It's a great start. Um, so if somebody could <laughs> make its way over uh, to Christian over there. Um. One nation was not mentioned yet uh, today. It was India. How is India involved in all this uh, today? I, I thought you were going to say Russia, but we're going to get to that maybe in the second part. So <laughs> India, India, maybe, maybe where to start, Bruno? India is, is a really important part of this story. Um, I wrote a, a, a longish preface for the India edition of the book uh, explaining how ambiguous India has been and, and how, in my opinion, unskillful China has been dealing with India. In my opinion, China thought that Russia had to be on board and negotiated very carefully with Putin uh, and got, in fact, and it surprised many observers, got Russia on board. Putin is going to go to the Belt and Road Forum. He's going to be one of the main stars there. Again, he's going to support it. India has been much more difficult. Um, you see that Kolkata is included there, but it really shouldn't be because India has made it clear that it doesn't want anything to do with the in initiative for the time being. Uh, in fact, it uh, boycotted the first Belt and Road Forum. It was, I believe, the only country that deliberately said, we are not going to send anyone at any level, we're not going to be present, and has started to create trouble for the Belt and Road in all sorts of ways. Uh, and the reasons are obvious, and they haven't been addressed by China. I think there are two main reasons. First, the Belt and Road goes, part of it, the crown jewel of the Belt and Road, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, goes through Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. The simple fact that it's called China-Pakistan Economic Corridor seems to suggest that Pakistan-occupied Kashmir is Pakistan. Perhaps something imaginative could have been done. You could have called it, but Pakistan would not have agreed, but you could have called it the China-Kashmir-Pakistan Economic Corridor or the China-India-Pakistan Economic Corridor. That was attempted, but very weakly, by China, and I think now China has a problem uh, that it has to solve to try to bring India on board. I cannot imagine a new global order being created by China without having India being part of it. Mm. Do you, any of you want to... Briefly respond. That's, that's a okay. great answer. Good. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> then let's move on. Um, maybe first over there, and then the second one over here, please. Agatha, I have a question for you. Um, you've talked about Sri Lanka already a little bit. I wonder, to what extent is it a threat to the success of BRI that China has been lending money 
to countries whose public finances might make it difficult for them to repay debt with interest? There's two parts to that question. Uh, there's the financial part and there's the uh, public relations, once again, part. Financially, um, the Belt and Road Initiative, the way I described it, especially lending-based projects throughout the world, as I said, about 50 billion per year, in actually um, a pretty much a big chunk, uh, a fall in 2018, but up to 2018, uh, about 50 billion per year. Uh, financially, even if you were to write 50% of that off, uh, compared to what China spends on its own domestic infrastructure, 100 billion per year just for high-speed rail in China. Uh, so lending 50 billion outward for all kinds of projects, some of which do make sense, um, is actually fine. Uh, it's financially kind of, sustain is it sustainable? Is it sustainable for China to lend to countries that can't pay back? It's probably okay, and it's probably okay to the tune that it is doing it at the moment. Now, in terms of PR, you've got two problems here. You've got a problem uh, with your own population, because you've got a population, you've got a set of enterprises within the country, you've got a set of institutions that are being told that they're going to have to take um, or they're going to have to sacrifice a lot over the next few years because growth is going to slow. They're going to have to deleverage. They're going to have to change their uh, consumption, spending, investment patterns uh, because it's become unsustainable within China. Uh, they're hearing that, of course, uh, poverty alleviation is still a very big issue, but social policies are advancing as fast uh, as they could be advancing in China. Um, all kinds of health, but also old age, young age kind of caring uh, policies not being deployed as fast as uh, they could be. Um, and on top of, I mean, and compared to that, a country that is spending on, on countries such as Venezuela, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Sri Lanka, that can't pay back. So you've, you're going to have a PR problem with your own population to try and explain to them why you spend money and lend money to countries that won't pay you back. But within your own population, uh, you don't allocate those 25 billion that you won't see back uh, to projects that could benefit the population. So you've got a PR blowback within your own population and beyond your border. Uh, if your whole point uh, is to try and increase cooperation, win-win, uh, mutual benefit, whichever term you want to use about it. But if you want to project the image of yourself as a benevolent actor, as an actor that is pro-development and as an actor that wants to promote good kind of uh, economically positive infrastructure in uh, target countries, uh, then if you lend to bad projects, projects that fail, projects that can't be repaid. If you put countries in a situation where in the Sri Lankan case, but if you take Zambia and Pakistan, where countries actually have to turn back to the IMF and go ask the IMF for a very strong reform package that they're going to have to follow through and be very, very strict about it. Um, if you ask countries uh, or if you allow countries to take over so much debt uh, and take over such an uh, sustainable projects is going to be a problem in the long term for, for your initiative but because it's as important how many projects you sign as as many projects as you implement and how fruitful they are for your economy really. Thanks. Thanks, quick reaction. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, just uh, from China's part, I think at the time China has four trillion U.S. dollars of foreign exchange reserves, and those reserves are put on uh, U.S. treasury bonds. So the bar is so low. It just ab above that is okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so pockets, pockets of money are there. So yeah. it's yeah. not sustainable. It is, it is okay to continue lending. But. Thank you. Um, Danny, you had a question, please. Thank you. Um, we heard from Agatha that there is quite some financial and fiscal resistance against some of the projects. We heard from you, Bruno, that this is not just a, a, a row of projects, but it's really a new political and economic world order. My question goes to you, Sengzili. <laughs> <laughs> Why then, if that is the case, now, and if you also consider that there is more resistance also on the ideological front, we haven't been speaking about religion with regard to Central Asia, etc. Why then has the Chinese leadership chosen to antagonize everybody? If this is going to be the new ideological uh, way to follow for the rest of the world, why antagonizing everybody around with um, the conditions of the Belt and Road Initiative? I would question if they have uh, actively made that decision, but <laughs> I may be wrong. <laughs> I don't think they, they, they wanted that. You know, it's, China is so big, and uh, China 
others want China to be a responsible stakeholder. And in the past, everyone is saying China should play a bigger role. China should go out. China should change its growth models. And then when China did, you are saying, oh, you now you are too big a stakeholder. So it's, uh, and also, at the very beginning, I think China underestimated the resistance from, from all this, and also underestimated the China-US trade dispute. Yeah. All right, um, we have one question here. Um, maybe we can get a microphone there somehow, and then another one afterwards, just behind you. Oh, no, sorry, you have, you haven't asked your question yet. Yes. <laughs> sorry, Felix, first Felix, then you, and then you. Sorry, I'm getting mixed up. Okay, uh, Bruno, a question to you. At the current moment, you see in, in, the, in the former Yugoslavian states of Balkan, you see the EU and China competing for financing infrastructure project. Is that a potential to develop that area, or does this project become mirrored in geopolitical issues and therefore the potential cannot be realized? Right. Uh, that's a big story to follow, of course. Uh, the EU has recently become um, uh, publicly uh, very unhappy about this. Uh, criticizing, for example, Bosnia extended a public guarantee to a, a, a Chinese project, something that it would not have done to a European project, uh, also because it's against the EU rules to do that kind of thing. Um, there are the case of Macedonia as well, where the United States and China are really involved in this uh, struggle to see who, who builds the, the, the new uh, roads that Macedonia is trying to build. Um, it's, it's, it's mostly, in my opinion, about money, making money uh, in the Balkans. I think China has even, to some extent, given up on the idea of connecting Piraeus to Central Europe through the Balkans. That's how I interpret the recent decision to invest in Italian ports. If you look at the map, it makes a lot more sense to connect Trieste to Central Europe than to connect Piraeus to Central Europe. But there's certainly, you know, the thing about... Uh, and I, I was in, in Macedonia looking at this in detail, talking to people in the embassies and so on. Uh, money making becomes political very quickly. A company like Bechtel, the American company, uh, once it starts to see Chinese competition, the embassies get involved. And it's not just the Chinese embassy that gets involved in these sort of things. The American embassy gets involved in these sort of things. So it becomes political. It becomes very intense. Uh, and now there's suddenly a new player. Uh, in a game that was already becoming highly competitive and difficult for European and American companies. That's how I interpret what is happening there. All right, please. Uh, I don't know if this is working and how does it work, but it's okay. Ah, now we are talking. <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah, I think the last question leads to my question very nicely because um, what I sense over the whole speech, which was excellent, I must say, very detailed, very, very well um, uh, researched, um, is uh, some fear. Some fear uh, of being taken over um, silently. And um, so from my point of view, I would say um, there are also uh, some uh, internal problems in Europe leading to this kind of fear, no matter who is attempting to take over. There is a lot of um, kind of um, unsolved problems awaiting Europe, and uh, and and uh, countries like Portugal or Italy uh, are only the peak of the iceberg, I would say, or Greece for that matter. So um, it is. Uh, it is necessary to find solutions inside Europe, I would say, before um, blaming others. So the question is, like, what, what should Europe do? Yeah. <laughs> the, sorry. The, yeah, please. please. Uh, so three things to respond to your question. The first one is um, fear of China overtaking Europe as kind of a benevolent development partner. Um, and here there's a European problem, there's a very clear European problem, which is we haven't delivered on our promises on development. If you look at the OECD commitments that we had that finished this year, we're all, and European countries I mean, below our commitments. Whereas China is putting on the table a very, very big amount of money uh, that is actually available and is actually available above expectation. So we've got a first problem here. And then we have two main problems, which is the way that I usually characterize the way that um, people feel like China is influencing countries in Europe, but they're actually European problem to a certain extent, is there's two reasons why you would want to turn to China. The first one is you've got an economy that has been hurt by the 2008 and the 2011-12 uh, euro debt crisis, uh, and you're trying to recover. And uh, your 
thinking to yourself um, in, a, in a kind of a latent hope that Chinese investment is going to help you out. And this is a European problem as well, uh, because this is for Europe to think about ways to rekindle economies uh, in a way that those economies won't have to count on China anymore or as much uh, for inward investment. So that latent kind of uh, self-censorship or latent kind of uh, desire to be um, dealing with China in the hope that investment will come in, more trade will come in, is something we need to deal with. And then the second one, and the second reason usually that countries, um, so the first case would be uh, Portugal, for example, uh, and Greece, uh, who were in such a very strong kind of economic difficulties that they had to turn to Chinese investment and China as a, as a opportunity partner. And then you've got countries who have a political reason uh, to lean towards China. Uh, why? Because usually they're Eurosceptic uh, and they have a very strong grudge against Brussels uh, that Brussels also needs to deal with. Why does Brussels politics produce and kind of kindle so much uh, resentment in some of the periphery countries potentially, in Italy now, but also in Hungary, you've seen that uh, before. And so blaming China is one thing, but one of the ways that I see China is just as one lever that countries use uh, when they want to, excuse my language, piece of Brussels. Uh, but in reality, um, if there were other levers around, they would use them as well. And if you take the case of Hungary, actually, there's two cases there uh, where there was a strong friction uh, between, China, uh, between uh, Hungary and Brussels. There was one case where it was a China project for a rail project, and there was one case where it was a Russian uh, project for a power plant. Uh, and so those are really cases where countries would use pretty much any lever uh, to try and upset Brussels. And so we need to reflect on ourselves as well, I think. You Just very quickly, so I think Agatha described very well the peripheries problem and how China inserts itself between the core and the peripheries. But there's another problem that relates directly to the core. Uh, there's the moment when Germany realized that uh, its uh, Industrie 4.0 plans coincided exactly to the China manufacturing 2025. Uh, and suddenly there was a shock, economic and psychological. The psychological is very obvious to, if you, if you go to Berlin and talk to people. The economic, so you know, we probably have followed this here, uh, third quarter of last year, uh, negative growth in Germany, and fourth quarter, 0.0. Uh, .0. So Germany ex escaped reception by one decimal point. In my opinion, this has a lot to do with China and the beginning of, a, of an economic China shock. And, and if this is correct, then the story is only starting. Yeah, Very briefly. On, on China 2025, really we don't understand. It's a myth to us why, why, why other countries uh, look so important to that report. Just like we said, China has, has a lot of plans, right? We, we say that China 2025 is really training or is just paying taxes by, by boasting or by, by, you know, it's, it's uh, we, we also have this uh, economic zone plan that with Yunnan going nowhere. We also have this Changsanjiao, Yangtze River plan, and, and other plans. For China 2025, it's, it's not, it's not a... Um... Okay, but forget about the plan. It, yeah. it is true that, that there are hundreds of uh, very promising AI companies in Beijing, in Anzhou, and in Shenzhen. Uh, and Germans look at this and they get worried because they were supposed to lead this uh, AI's ro AI robotics revolution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. let's, let's get one last question before the coffee break, and then, please. China Position itself, like politically or militarily, in regards to the Middle East, is this about to change, and if so, how and when? Good one. Well, I, uh, my wife is actually writing a thesis about China in the Middle East, so I talk about that with her a lot. And I, I advised against it because I don't see a lot of action uh, for the time being. China cannot be uh, everywhere. Um, there are certainly relations that are developing with Iran. I'm going to be two weeks from now in a Belt and Road conference in Tehran with Saudi Arabia. Uh, but they don't seem to me particularly, they just seem to be a priority for China right now. There are other parts of the world that I would look more closely at. Uh, but clearly, as an energy source, it's important. Uh, but China is also very reluctant to get involved in a region that is in <laughs> permanent combustion. And certainly, Syria uh, is, is, is not a place where China would, would want to get involved. Yeah. 
I would add two things to that. The first one is that uh, as much as China for a very long time wanted to have a depoliticized approach to the world, very economically based, uh, and also to have a non-interventionist policy, uh, the mere fact that you internationalize, be it through lending, be it through in investment or trade, uh, means that you're going to have to be involved at some point. Because if a country uh, bursts up into a revolution in Libya and you have to move all of your workers out of the country, then you need to have some kind of either a military non-threatening, non-aggressive, but a kind of a military backup plan for, for not having to use an Italian ship to get your workers out of the country. Uh, and you need to have a political system that deals with this as well, to know who you speak to after for the transition, how you make sure that your investments are protected after the new regime comes in, things like this. Uh, so as much as China, and I completely agree with you, that uh, the Middle East is probably the worst case scenario in terms of getting involved, because you just put a finger and you get snuck into it. <laughs> and it's really something that uh, they do not want want to happen. Um, as investments into the region grow, they will have to be more uh, present. One form that this takes, and this is very uh, uh, non-interventionist to a certain extent for the moment, is uh, either peacekeeping missions or as a arbiter of, or you know, someone in the room that will help people talk mm -hmm. to each other. And for the moment, that's been very neutral, but it's one of the positions that China has taken, especially in the Middle East. Let me just add 10 seconds that if China is successful in increasing its links to the Middle East, maybe we'll have to get used to calling it West Asia. Because <laughs> that's the expression in China. Sekshin, do you have anything yeah. to share maybe on the views in China on the Middle East? Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> short, short, short and sweet. All right, with that, um, thank you.